Good morning. Well, I'm here with Tom Fanning, who is, let me get this right, you're the chairman, you're the president and the CEO of Southern Company. Is there any other titles you haven't snapped up? Uh, no. Okay. He's been 30 years at Southern Company and run 15, worked in 15 business units, but in addition to that, he's the deputy chair of the Atlantic Federal Reserve Board, and he's on the Electric Security Coordinating Council, a mysterious sounding group that I'm going to ask him a little bit about. Yeah, that's good stuff. And Southern, um, which in case you haven't heard of it, is one of the biggest electric utilities in the U.S., um, has about 4.4 million customers, is that right, in Southeast, and has 26,000 employees. It's mostly interesting to us now because they placed a lot of big bets on uh, certain types of technology, and I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. So we're going to talk about the grid. Um, I'm a reporter for The Atlantic, and the uh, last few years I've been working, gone back to energy issues and visited a number of these electric utility control centers. Biggest one I've seen is in ERCOT, I think it's called. It's in Taylor, Texas, and it's this huge room with this kind of Dr. Strangelove screens all over the place, and all these uh, controls the electricity for about three quarters of the state of Texas, and just, it's unbelievably complicated. And so you talk to the people there and other electric utilities, and what you get the feeling is that the American um, electric grid is both a miracle and a total mess. <laughs> um, it's like half miracle, half mess. No, it's so, not. Yeah, it's like Dr. Johnson's talking dog. You don't know whether to be <laughs> amazed that it does it or complain that it does it so poorly. So, so let's talk about you have what you have in these centers, which you know I kind of think of as that's where the grid is. You know, because I can picture it at least. Yeah, right. Just all these different sources of power funneling in here and being matched with demand. Yeah. Okay, and it's kind of like an air traffic control center there, where they're kind of constantly turning up and turning or turning down. It's like that, except a lot more automatic. Yeah. yeah. But there's definitely nervous guys in t-shirts and, and in white shirts sweating about it. And so let's talk about the fact that the first thing that they'll tell you when you go there is that everything's really old. That um, something like half, I think it is, our, our coal power plants are already at their expected lifetime that by, 20, by, by 2050, everything is going to have to be replaced. This is going to be a great discussion. <laughs> okay. Let me jump in. All right. I was about to let you say that. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, the United States has at least two different types of power markets. There are integrated, regulated mm -hmm. markets, and then there are those markets back, I guess it was in the 90s, that went through a deregulated period. The head of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at that time was a guy named Pat Wood, mm -hmm. who was the chairman of the Texas Public Utilities Commission. And in my opinion, the move of the United States to the so-called organized markets uh, is a really bad idea. And it has not served the United States, the economy, or customers well. When you made the comment about Texas, that may be about Texas. I've not been in the ERCOT, Energy Reliability Council Control of Texas. Texas. I haven't been in the ERCOT control room. I've been in our room a lot. Uh, we spend about a billion dollars every year and have spent about that pace of money on the grid really since I can kind of remember, I mean, my last few jobs besides doing what I'm doing now was COO, Chief Operating Officer. I lived in Birmingham and mm -hmm. used to go down there all the time. Before that, I was CFO, so I knew all about what we were spending. Before that, I was CEO of one of the subs, so I knew kind of what was going on. So look, looking back in the rear view mirror, we spend about a billion bucks a year every year. The notion on, on repairs and maintenance, or what is yeah, it? Yeah, and, and, and new lines. Mm -hmm. and, and we ought to get into something else, too, about the, the uh, reliability of the grid and mm -hmm. in terms of... But do you remember after the blackout in the Midwest and the mm -hmm. Northeast, and who was it? Was it Governor Richardson or mm -hmm. former Energy Secretary Richardson said we had a third world grid? He's dead wrong. That now. seems harsh. Well, he's wrong. Yeah. And... What you see from one market, integrated regulated market, where you have a regular, predictable, sustainable kind of environment in which to invest capital, relative to these so-called organized markets, which are largely deregulated, the challenge in the deregulated markets is that there's an insufficient um, capacity signal, price signal, 
that will cause somebody to invest long-term capital. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission business over the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, it has been a litany of what are things we can do to induce people to make these investments? Because they've lost this end-to-end -end make, move, and sell obligation to represent mm -hmm. customers, which you have in an integrated market. So. My only point was, mm -hmm. that may be true in ERCOT, and it may be true in the deregulated mm -hmm. markets. That is absolutely not true mm -hmm. in the Southeast. And if you want data to support these assertions, just look at uh, the federal energy stuff. There's two geeky sounding statistics called SADI and SAFI. It's a D and an F. Uh, SAFI deals with the frequency of interruptions on the grid. We have been now, I think it's about a 14 year trend of improvement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our frequency of interruptions on the grid is the best it's ever been. Say D says, this is the duration of the interruptions once they invariably will occur. And they're also at an all time low. The other thing that, let me just add one more thing and then we'll, we'll go wherever. Wherever you guys want to go too, it'd be fun. The other thing that Southern Company has done by virtue of these investments in the grid, and at one time in my career, I was CIO, Chief Information Officer. And uh, we have developed and implemented technology in the grid way before Smart Grid was mm -hmm. cool. We did take advantage of some um, federal subsidies to do more. Actually, we, all we do is accelerate what we were already planning to do but you would not believe the technology in the networks today. And in fact, we have the ability, we have predictive power in the grid so that we can ping in milliseconds what's going on and actually predict failures before they happen so that we're able to kind of get ahead of the game and don't just react to a problem. So these are all reasons why I just reject the notion that everything is old and it's falling apart. It's just wrong. Okay, but it there are definitely things that are old, no? The expected Almost. lifetime of the plants and so forth. You hear all these statistics. These, are, these, are, these statistics are, are not so you, accurate. So you're talking about plants? For example, yeah. Oh, sure, okay. Well, I was talking about transmission lines. Okay. Uh, transmission lines do have a long life, but right. they get replaced and maintenanced and all that stuff. They get upgraded. Okay, let's talk about plants. Okay. This is Suppose you have, now here's something I was thinking, because right sure. now um, the, the utility industry is, is, looks from the outside grappling with a big transition. Before your job yes. was to keep the lights on. That was uh -huh. pretty much it. Keep the lights on as regular and steady as possible. Mm -hmm. and now you have all these environmental concerns that you, that you also have to deal with while keeping the lights on. So what I would Carbon say- and, and, and so forth. If you looked at any of my stuff, and I see mm -hmm. they've handed out some speeches or position papers I've given. We have always had the idea and the accountability of providing clean, safe, reliable, affordable energy for the benefit of the families we're privileged to serve. We've always had that. Mm -hmm. See, if you go back to where the Clean Air Act was passed, a great piece of legislation that was during the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So if you go back 40 something years ago, at least by law, we've always had this obligation. The idea somehow that there's been this enormous shift in the obligation we have. Mm -hmm. I, Charles, here again, I, I'm not sure I buy that. I think people have always wrestled with the balancing act of clean, safe, reliable, affordable. What you do have now is a lot more volume around what are the issues that you're dealing with. You know, the latest has been the GHG, the greenhouse gas uh, rule that's been proposed by EPA. So that's kind of the latest thing, right? So um, in thinking about this balancing act, you are absolutely mm -hmm. right in the fact that there is an enormous transition. Now, if anybody wants to look this up, I've been on the record a lot about what this transition has kind of looked at. The biggest influencer in the transition mm -hmm. has not really been, I think, this GHG issue that EPA is now on. Greenhouse gases. Yes. It was the issue before, and it's actually traveled under a few names. I, you know, the government uses these acronyms, but one was called HAPS, H-A-P-S, MACT, 
M-A-C-T. Now I think it's officially known as MATS, M-A-T-S. What that dealt with was a new set of standards for things like nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, mercury, particulate matter, and a variety of other things. That set of rules has had a much more profound effect on the transitioning of the fleet. Let me give you our data there. Um, so that was passed, what, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And there is a transition period so that by 2015 or 16, depending on what latitude you ask for, you will transition a lot of the nation's generating fleet. When EPA first proposed the rule, and I had to testify in front of Congress mm -hmm. on this, EPA said, oh, I think we'll only retire about 5,000 megawatts of the nation's coal fleet. I testified I thought it would be 60 to 70,000 megawatts, and I was right. Mm -hmm. Southern companies' data were... How much, wait, <coughs> since between what dates and what dates are you talking about here? By six, 2016. Okay. By 2016 or 15, depending on the latitude. But some of that presumably is also driven by the natural gas. The, Not the really. You really, and, and, and really think it's purely hang, emissions. Yeah, and let's hang on to that thought, because okay. that's an important thought. So don't forget that. Okay. What, we, uh, what we've done at Southern Company, Southern Company is one of the nation's largest energy producers. In fact, we're about the size, a bit smaller, but about the size as the nation of Australia in terms of energy production. And we serve Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, the panhandle of Florida, and then we've got competitive generation. Texas, Nevada, New Mexico, California, North Carolina, deeper in Florida, a variety of places. And what we've done, we used to be this huge coal company, right? 70% of our energy came from coal. In six short years, we've turned this aircraft carrier to now it's not 70% coal, it's 35. And it's not 16% natural gas is what it used to be, now it's about 45. Nuclear has been constant at about 16, and then you make up the balance with either renewables or things like hydro. Mm -hmm. I also include in this energy efficiency. We can get to that later, mm -hmm. too. It's an interesting concept, how you think about energy efficiency. In the pre-MATS days, this very impactful EPA regulation, Southern Company had 20,000 megawatts of coal, one of the biggest coal fleets in America. By 2016, we will have only 13,000 megawatts. And we are shutting down 3,000 of the seven. 20 less 13 is seven. So we're shutting down completely 3,000. The other 4,000, uh, we're converting to essentially high, well, high heat rate, low efficiency gas units. That's what they're going to look like. So we've moved from coal to gas. Mm -hmm. Now, let's come back to your point. When we think about the difference in what's happened in the gas markets mm -hmm. relative to what's happened in EPA regulation, don't mean to get geeky with you, but it's an important distinction that, mm -hmm. that you highlight with your question. There is a difference between energy and capacity. Capacity is the, is the amount of units that sit on the ground that have the capability to generate electricity and they really go to the heart of the reliability of the United States grid. One of the interesting facts, this doesn't impact Southern as much, but one of my mm -hmm. great friends in the industry is Nick Akins. He's the CEO of American Electric Power. You all remember Polar Vortex 1 and 2, right? Mm -hmm. Atlanta was the center of Armageddon mm -hmm. during uh, uh, Polar Vortex 1. But what's fascinating is, in order to meet the loads, of Polar Vortex 1 and 2, a significant amount of the capacity in America that is due to be retired by 16 ran, like 75% of the time. Capacity is a very important issue. The effect of the EPA regulations will be to retire that capacity, 60 to 70,000 megawatts. The United States reliability will suffer because of that. What we've got to do as an industry is replace it somehow. And there's lots of interesting things. So let's things. talk about replacing it. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Let's finish with the concept first. So, so renewables and new nuclear and the mm -hmm. full portfolio, I talk about that all the time. It's in the paper. I've been out there. The, so that's a capacity reliability argument. The argument mm -hmm. that you suggested was, oh, it's all about gas. Well, no, if it's, it's the price of gas. Well, okay, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so Southern's made this huge shift to natural gas, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we would have retired the capacity. Mm -hmm. We certainly have changed the energy output. Southern Company operates always to deliver, in an integrated regulated market, the cheapest energy available to our customers all the time. That's the way the power pool works. We don't make more money off of energy. Our big control room down yeah. in the, you know, stories below the ground in Birmingham, that is their job. Make sure it's reliable and make sure that our customers get the cheapest energy every microsecond they can. That is an energy argument and gas has had an enormous influence mm -hmm. in energy. The gas issue has had almost no effect on capacity. I see. So now you're talking about replacing that capacity. Yes. And the striking thing, at least to me as an outsider, is that <clears throat> almost every method that you talk about for replacing capacity, whether it's you know, advanced coal, nuclear, renewables, whatever, you can construct an argument to say what a terrible idea this is. That or what have, a, well, or I mean, conversely also what a good idea it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so you guys are kind of doing an all of the above That's right. thing. And so you're also running into all of the issues for all of them. Yes. Right. So you have these tremendous costs for, for building a nuclear power plant. You have the tremendous costs for um, carbon capture and storage. And then you have the tremendous fluctuation in, um, in reliability issues for, for renewables like mm -hmm. solar, and, solar and wind. Mm -hmm. So since you're in the hot seat and you're looking at the downsides as well as the upsides of all of them, right. how does it look for you? You know, when you talk about replacing this capacity with all these different choices here, and also you have to make these long-term big bets yeah. that most business executives don't have to do because you're working on a time frame of many decades, what does it look like? Hey, uh, so you hit on so many interesting things. Mm -hmm. well, he keeps using the phrase big bets. Go on iBooks mm -hmm. and yeah. the history of Southern Company had our centennial uh, what was it, 1912 to 2012, is named Big Bets. So I love the fact he's using, actually plugging the book. Well, just the numbers. I mean, the Kemper County thing, I was just no. looking at the papers. Which, yeah. The budget for that is $5.5 billion. One plant, right? Yeah. You know, uh, the, the nuclear plant is... $14 billion or something? Yeah. 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 No, so these a are, lot of money. These are Big Bets. And then you're buying all this solar, which is many billions there. Uh, and the shift to gas is pretty yeah. risky. Yeah. The other thing that, that Charles picked up on, I, I always like to point out, uh, as I did this yesterday on the panel, but um, so I have been out talking this energy policy thing. I did the weekend interview mm -hmm. in the Wall Street Journal almost two years ago now. And I was talking about the risk to America of this rush to natural gas and why natural gas is not a panacea. I did mm -hmm. talk about the other elements of the portfolio, but the Wall Street Journal, and you know, any of you that do media, the, the article can get it all right, but the headline is what tells the story, right? And the headline of that story was the natural gas skeptic. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'm a skeptic on everything, for heaven's sakes. I, I, see, I try to see the pros and cons of everything. As you all own stocks, right? You don't own just one stock, and I hope you own Sutter Company. But I know that you all buy a series of different stocks, and the whole notion is in the portfolio, you maximize value by matching up and optimizing your mix of risk and return. I can make the argument for risk and return for every element of the nation's energy portfolio. And that's why I have been so convicted that the United States needs to, as a national priority, continue to take advantage of the blessings that we have. Charles, one of the things I do is I co-chair at the Business Roundtable, so this is a group of the CEOs of America, the North American Energy Security Plan. To me, we are at a moment in this nation's history, unlike any of our lifetimes or your parents' lifetimes, where the United States now can set policy however you may mm -hmm. want to think about policy or the absence of policy, in the notion of abundance, not scarcity. And I think we have the ability through energy policy to grow GDP, reject this idea of a new normal and slow growth mm -hmm. and unacceptably high unemployment, and restart manufacturing and grow jobs and grow personal incomes and make American lives better. I think energy policy can lead the way. I think we think about frozen government. In my view, the only entity in America outside CEOs and companies that are going to lead the way here is Congress. Congress is the only other entity that has the lens of accountability for the full portfolio of clean, safe, reliable, affordable. 
And so I really work hard with Congress to try and get that. I think there's a lot of bipartisan mm -hmm. support. Before it was Murkowski and Wyden, now Mary mm -hmm. Landrieu in the Senate, in the House, there's been great leadership. And I know we have the politics that frustrate us all. But I think energy policy and a way for America to play offense in a worldwide economy, I think is something that's so exciting. It's such an opportunity, we've got to get it right. Well, simultaneously, while you're rebuilding the capacity, we're also dramatically changing the grid. Mm -hmm. The grid itself, the, <clears throat> the transmission with things like energy storage, smart grid, you name it. There's a whole laundry list of technologies. You bet. This is, in fact, why my son has gone into the energy business, because he thinks it's this enormous opportunity. Things are going to really happen in his lifetime. I think it's fascinating. So let's talk about <clears throat> making a smarter, smarter grid which is essentially using, harness, in, at some level, harnessing the power of network computing to make everything go faster and also to empower the consumer as well as expose everybody to the, to the enormous security threats that uh, sec the computers bring with them. Oh man, huge issue. Yeah. And, and good luck to your son. I, <laughs> he, 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 the, listen, you know, it's funny. When it, I think when I <coughs> excuse me, joined the Southern Company out mm -hmm. of graduate school at Georgia Tech. I thought, oh, I'll stay there three years and mm -hmm. then go be an investment banker or something. You know, I started out in corporate finance. The issues that we're seeing right now in terms of electricity as the economy continues to get more electrified, mm -hmm. I think the data will show that of any energy consumptive resource, electricity is going five and a half times the rate of anything else. So the economy is getting more and more mm -hmm. electrified. You think about transportation, you think about digital computing, you think about entertainment. Yeah. In fact, if you ever download a Netflix, so if you watch like an hour of Netflix once a week, it's the equivalent when you think about all the servers that get lit up along the way of adding a new refrigerator mm -hmm. to the electric requirements of the United States. Let's go to the notion of innovation and what happens on the grid. Let's start and just expand it a wee mm -hmm. bit, if I could. Make, move, and sell. So when we think about the importance of technology, let's start with make. So this is converting a fuel stock into an electron. Okay? What we got to do is make that more efficient. Fact, What's the percentage of waste right now? You know, the, the conversion cost, the transition cost? So it, it cost, really yeah. depends on the fuel type. Okay. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of efficiency in natural gas. Mm -hmm. There's some inefficiency in coal. Nuclear is exceedingly efficient. So, you know, it depends. You know, you get 50, 60 percent of inefficiency. And I'm, I'm talking the whole chemical right. balancing mm -hmm. equations of taking whatever fuel stock you want. And in fact, electricity generation is not at all mysterious. You use different fuels, gas, coal, nuclear, to essentially boil water to create steam, to turn a turbine and create electricity. That's the simplest way. Now, I'll get to renewables here in a minute, but that, that is by far what you see in America today. So it's a piece of cake in terms of conceptually, what do we do? The EPA, as part of the greenhouse gas proposal, wants us to get more efficient for some of the issues. So we'll see how we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so the first place mm -hmm. that energy efficiency is taking place and technology innovation is in the make side. Southern Company's fossil hydro fleet, so mm -hmm. it's the coal and gas side, and hydro, is one of the most efficient in the United States. I think if we wring out every bit of new efficiency, and that will require us to perhaps buy new turbines and do some big capital mm -hmm. investment, billions of dollars of stuff, we might be able to wring out another 2%. And we've told the EPA that. In yep. the EPA greenhouse gas proposal, they want six. It'd be fascinating to see how you get there. Is and, it, and, is and, this wait, counting um, also the parasitic costs of kind of the cleanup that's involved for, for cleaner coal and, and that kind of stuff? Is it 2% just of the plants you got? Or is it 2% after you've retrofitted them to comply with all the new emissions? It would be required. after the retrofits. And you're right, the parasitic loads are awesome. When you look yeah. at this technology we're deploying in uh, Kemper County, Mississippi, right. it's really a chemical plant. Yeah. The, the, the electricity side of it is just here. And then there's this enormous chemical plant where we're gonna gasify coal, lignite, sitting right there at the, at the plant. We run it into our process. It's a circulating fluidized bed. It's not very common in the United States. 
we will essentially combust in a reduced oxygen environment so it doesn't create a flame. It reduces the synthesis gas. We capture the synthesis gas, like this is the thing. There's a little pipe that comes off there. We capture the synthesis gas, we put filters on it, and that's where we take out 65% of the CO2. This coal plant, in fact, low-grade coal, lignite, will have a carbon footprint less than natural gas. We take the natural gas, we take the CO2, it's not a waste stream in this case, we push it into the ground, and we push out more oil. It's called enhanced oil recovery. You will create, when this plan is complete, we think, imagine this, two million more barrels of domestic oil, reducing our dependency on nations that are not always friendly to us. And imagine this, we'll produce more electricity. Now, I should explain the parasitic costs, what we're talking about. So is, it's running this gigantic yes, chemical exactly. plant. It has to be subtracted from yeah. the output. And it's, what is, what is it going to be? Is it 20%, oh, 20, yeah. 30%? I, I bet it's even the higher output. there. Because yeah. the, this thing almost looks like a chemical plant, not mm -hmm. an electricity plant. The electricity side of it isn't that big a deal. Creating the gasification stream and then taking the different segments of the gas. In other words, CO2 out, sulfuric acid out, ammonia out, and using all these things as byproducts to be reconsumed in the economy is a big deal. But let's keep yeah. going, let's okay. keep going. I don't want to get too bogged down on generation. But please understand, everything you're talking about, and you're exactly right, applies to generation right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Let's go to the grid. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think about the grid, let's think about it in two segments. One is transmission, one is distribution. The great big wires, the little wires that connect to your house, right? And then there are substations in between. So there's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. issues around that that go to cybersecurity as well as mm -hmm. physical security. So... As I kind of went through with you before, the big challenge here is to put enough smart technology, sensors essentially, so that not only can you see what's happening in real time, but become predictive and adaptive before mm -hmm. the problems occur. And that's where you continue to get this continued improvement. Uh, third world transmission system, no way. Uh, then you get to the end of the wires mm -hmm. <coughs> and you get now to what we lovingly call smart meters. Now, Southern Company is one of the United States leaders in smart meters, but let's be clear about that. I always am cautious of buzzwords. So our smart meters are essentially digital, not mechanical looking meters, right? And what they do, instead of being connected with hard wires to kind of measure this mechanical um, consumption of energy, they digitize and send us on a wireless basis. So you may be remember in the old days you had a, a, a lineman or a, a meter reader actually come to your house and jot into something here what your meter said. Well, we've deployed effectively 100% of our meters, effectively 100, there's a little bit in Mississippi mm -hmm. that's not, uh, smart, uh, smart meters. We use it right now, and this is cybersecurity and a variety of other issues. We use it right now to take people out of the field and trucks off the road. <clears throat> it's good for our bottom line, it's good for the environment. Now let me ask you a question though about the yeah, security sure. issues. Um, I live deal. in Amherst, Massachusetts, right next to the University of Massachusetts, which has a laboratory there where basically they have a bunch of computer scientists and their job is to hack the, these things and show how you can use these to take over your house, to set off the alarms, to do all kinds of tricks that they, right. they do. That's right. So, and Charles, great yeah. stuff. See, okay, so you're looking at somebody. You know how you have parents that may have lived through the Depression and that affects their behavior? So I'm a former CIO. In many days, Charles, I thought that stood for career is over. <laughs> Let me tell you, it is a scary big deal what's going on in the cyberspace. Mm -hmm. We have not turned on, via smart meters, the notion of smart homes in the Southeast because of the issue you raise. I am not satisfied that that technology is ready for prime time from a cyber protection standpoint. Either that somebody could infiltrate your house or that they could steal data. Now, we work like crazy. I'm not satisfied to turn on that capability. So, our smart meters. We just digitize the reading and take people off the field. So your smart meters are still dumb on the dumb end of the smart scale. 
Well, uh, but intentionally so. Yeah, they're, 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 the capability is there. I don't feel good about the cyber aspects of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very concerned about that. It, we should do ESCC here in yeah. a minute. But the other thing that's going to unlock smart home, there's a guy here, Nest, right? Mm -hmm. I think technologies like Nest may be the better way. So that's your thermostat. And again here, those of you that grew up with VCRs, remember when you first got your VCR, nobody could figure out how to program it, and so you just had the blinking light, remember that? <laughs> blinking 12s. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. So here's what I think we gotta do on the thermostat side, and that's where I'm really fascinated with where Nest is trying to go. Here again, it is adaptive behavior. If anything is gonna require human intervention, then my sense is its adopted adoption rate and its penetration and usefulness will be really low. But if the technology can kind of understand you, you've heard about the old story about Bill Gates' house where you walk in and there's a digital painting on the wall. And if he walks in, it's a painting of so-and-so. If Melinda walks in, the painting changes right. because the painting can sense who's in the room and what do they like to look at. That's the way your house is going to go, I think. And I think, I don't know whether it's the nest that we see now. So there's this, another buzzword you hear is disruption. We can talk mm -hmm. about disruption in a minute. I don't think nest is disruptive just yet, but I think maybe the next generation may be, and I think that's really exciting. So I'm not so concerned about the dumbness or smartness yeah. or the smart meter that doesn't reach into the house. I think we're in a good spot with smart meters, at least where we are. I think the interesting smartness will not come through the meter, but through other devices mm -hmm. in the house. And if I had to give you an analog here, <clears throat> Southern Company is the only company in our industry that does proprietary robust research and development. We have technology people, we have all kinds of interesting stuff, and we go through visioning exercises every five years. And we went through a visioning exercise five years ago, where, and imagine it was just five years ago, they predicted the iPhone. They said, oh, multifunctional thing. And we actually have our own telecom device that does four things. It's really cool. But what we did not predict is not the multifunctional phone, but rather the power of the integration of the mm -hmm. apps. And that's, I think, the analog that we should look to see in terms of make, move, and sell and consume. It is the app inside the house that will influence our behavior. So that's kind of a really interesting idea. Can I turn to cybersecurity? Just briefly, ESCC. then we are, we're going to open okay. it to questions in just a minute. We have a million more things to talk about, but, right. but let's talk about cybersecurity for a minute, because I don't think you've talked about that while you're here yet. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay, so this is fascinating stuff. So we know that the United States is challenged all the time with cyber attacks, with kind of protecting the nation against physical terrorism, and then we're always vigilant about natural disasters. Uh, under the Department of Homeland Security, they have essentially segmented the United States commerce into 16 pieces. They're called coordinating councils under the Department of Homeland Security. <clears throat> the electricity sector, so the electricity sector coordinating council is one of the 16. And actually there's other things in there like oil and gas, but they're not all that well developed right now. The electricity sector absolutely is. And in fact, we're held out by the United States government as the model for everybody to follow. I'm the chairman for the United States of the Electricity Sector Coordinating Council. And with that, we have kind of coordinated all investor-owned utilities, cooperative utilities, and municipal mm -hmm. utilities under one umbrella to set in place regimes of protection against cyber terrorism, physical terrorism, and you know, planning for and then adapting to natural disasters when they invariably occur. I'm thinking hurricanes, tornadoes, snowfall, that kind of thing. And let me tell you something, it is a big, big deal. Um, it's a very important issue. I'm proud to say the, the electricity sector is out there. And when, remember when you said originally in the old days all you worried about was keeping the lights on? Right. Which I took a little bit of exception to, but that's okay. It is the genetic makeup of our industry to do just that. That is so important to us. Let me give you a quick story. Polar Vortex 2, mm -hmm. big snowstorm, especially around Augusta, Georgia. We had a lineman that was donating his kidney to his wife during that time. 
He held off the operation to work the storm. Once the last person was turned on with power, he checked into the hospital and donated his kidney. I, could, I know any other company could tell those stories. I could tell you lots more. We take it very seriously. And this whole Electricity Sector Coordinating Council has the firm endorsement and involvement of every CEO in the industry. You don't see that everywhere else. You should feel very good. Now let me hit just a couple of quick stories on those. Cyber terrorism. Our industry has adopted a single cyber protection regime where we can essentially evaluate activity coming across our computer networks. We can, in a central place with the partnership of the United States government, evaluate anomalies, assess those anomalies, and then react to them. And there's lots of interesting things. There's two words that you hear in cyber terrorism called blackboarding and whiteboarding. Whiteboarding means you only let friends in. Blackboarding means you, you know there are known enemies and you keep them out. There is a whole enormous level of activity undertaken by the Department of Homeland Security. They do a darn good job looking across all industries to assess the level of threat and activity. In the physical um, terrorism world, uh, you may have heard about this Metcalf mm -hmm. incident. So this is a transmission substation that was attacked, it looks like, in an organized way, mm -hmm. uh, and they killed the substation. There was a following um, article, it was actually about nine months later, but still, there was an article by uh, the Wall Street Journal that talked about the theory that you could attack some number of substations, transmission substations in the United mm -hmm. States and bring down the grid. <clears throat> if you want to look, <clears throat> Google this latest interview I did, that's just not likely at all. I think people that espouse that theory don't know what they're talking about. When we think about the reliability of the grid, it is a very dynamic issue. And in fact, when you go back to the Metcalf case, yeah, they killed that substation. Not one light blinked in California. That was near Silicon Valley. So my sense is what you should know, and I, I can't tell you everything we're doing on a physical side because we like to keep that confidential, but you must know that we evaluate all critical infrastructure in the United States. It goes to nuclear plants, conventional plants, transmission systems, substations, you name it. <clears throat> and we have protection regimes in place, whether it is directly impacting building a wall around a substation, or whether it's plainclothesmen in an area, or whatever the evaluation must be and the best way to protect those critical assets. Last thing on natural disasters. The Southeast has always been in pretty good shape. We always, and unfortunately, we get the uh, disadvantage of practice right. <laughs> because we have lots of hurricanes. So we kind of know how to do storms. Hurricane Sandy was a very challenging event for so many people because it was so unusual. Mm -hmm. Well, in the United States, there are things called RMAGs, sorry for the acronym again, Regional Mutual Assistance Groups, R-M-A-G. And what we have done since Sandy in fact, Southern Company was the biggest provider of help to the Northeast uh, among any company in America. But uh, what we have done together is knitted the various regional mutual assistance groups, simplified them that were pretty fragmented in the Northeast, and now we have, I think, uh, a, a much better way to respond to, uh, to all those things. So we could open it up for questions. Yeah, great. And, uh, in this talk, I've tried to focus on things that you didn't talk about. Yeah, right. Yeah, but if you have questions about those, please. First, an observation. It's refreshing to finally hear somebody who's so thoughtful and measured regarding something that's very complex. I mean, energy in this country go on forever. Thanks. <clears throat> With that said, uh, there's a butt in there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a psychologist by training, so there always, there always is. Uh, and it's my birthday today, so give me okay, a break. Happy birthday. Thank you. So, so at any rate, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio. From 1930 to 1970, Youngstown, northeastern Ohio, was uh, fifth largest steel producing city in the, in the country. 
with that said, it hasn't been good for 35 years. Sure. Good news yeah. was I'm in Columbus now. <laughs> the next shiny thing that came across was fracking. Right. So the French put a $5 billion factory there to make the tubing, and everybody's happy. Except the last 18 months, there's been over 100 micro earthquakes in that area. And most geologists default to the only thing that's changed is we're throwing stuff into the, in the, into the ground. Can you speak to the safety of fracking and you know, where that stands? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. It's a very important question. Um, here again, I don't want to repeat myself, and you can look at the Wall Street Journal. When I say there are five reasons why it should be costless in natural gas, let me hit them really quickly. One is evaluating the environmental impacts of fracking. That's what I always lead off with. Number two is building out the infrastructure. Number three is what's going to be our national policy on exporting. I think everything. Four, what's going to happen to price and volatility uh, when we do this huge demand curve shift in the United States. And five is we've got to find a way to hedge that for the benefit of the economy and the citizens we're pleased to serve. When you think about this first point, what about fracking? The United States has made an enormous bet to go to natural gas, some would say as a transitional fuel, mm -hmm. so for the next 50 years. And it has been a huge blessing to the economy. But the fact is, the environmental questions, whether they're these micro earthquakes or whether it's issues related to water, uh, I've said here that I know people get high centered on air. I think the air in the United States is really in pretty good shape for the marginal cost and the marginal benefit. I think some of the bigger issues facing us is water. Southern Company is the only company in America today that does water research on power generation. The answer is I don't know. But I know that a lot, of, I'm sorry, but a lot of people are focused on that. And so, I, you raise a very important issue. Me, wait, wait, oh, just sorry. a sec. We need, as the United States, if we're making this big bet to natural gas, and if, you know, you should understand that every megawatt you go to on renewables needs a backup generation when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine until we solve storage, which is a real disruptor, and that's going to be natural gas. As a policy decision, the United States is making this move, and we still don't know the answer to those questions, we've got to get about finding that out. Very important issue. So how much of these issues do you think are related to the structure of the fracking industry, which is, a, you know, in many cases, a million sort of mom and pop outfits, very small outfits that are kind of plugging away with no really regulatory structure in this super, in I think the phrase the geologists use is inhomogeneous, um, in, you know, underground environment. So you have, you know, essentially, you and I can get together and start a fracking company and start drilling. It's cheap. That's scary. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's... And so you it have is. thousands and thousands of these things being done by very and tiny outfits that, hey, the, they, that you know, when, the, when something goes wrong, they just go out of business. The, the other issue is methane yeah. release at the yeah. wellhead. That's and the other issue, right? So in a certain way, this is one of the things where I would think you would want the bigger guys to come in, which are suable entities at the very, end, at the very least. <laughs> so here's, here's kind of the issue there. And Charles, yeah. I think you're right. I agree broadly with what you said. Um, you know, one of the blessings of innovation, I think there's a lot of people that can claim innovation. One of the people I like in that industry is Devon, D-E-V-O-N. Mm -hmm. um, they're one of the early leaders on the directional drilling, which permitted kind of the, this thing to happen. Um, <clears throat> there are, I, I think I agree with you, there are very responsible players, especially the big guys. The little guys um, do need a lot of oversight. And even, you know, it's one thing to have oversight and catch something that happens that goes wrong, but you've still done something wrong. Uh, it's a big issue. I, you know, th this is one of the issues that, uh, that uh, I think deserve a lot more national attention. So for a while, we might see some green grandchildren in the next 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but also, presumably, this, usually technologies get better as they go along. So you're seeing, at least some of what you're seeing, presumably, is birthing pains. And, and, and that industry is a mature industry. It's been around. They've been doing fracking, not like this, but been doing fracking in a lot of different ways for a long time. They will tell you that it's safe and everything else. There's a lot of people that are on the other side of the ledger. And one of the things, when I engage in these scientific debates, Southern reveres our credibility in science. We're the only ones that do research and development. We got PhDs, we got all this stuff. We're the only ones that have that depth. 1,600 people that do engineering and construction services. I really respect 
the differences of opinion on all sides of the issue. And what we really try to do is understand the issues pertinent to us and get those right and weigh in on a policy standpoint. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Could you comment on nuclear power and energy and uh, if you think about the emotional and visceral responses to it versus what a di dispassionate viewpoint is and why the United States is not willing to really go down that road? Yeah, so I got five minutes. If you, this could turn into an est session, and we can stay here for the next two to three hours. Um, I don't know what you think about carbon. If you believe that the United States is headed towards a carbon-constrained future, you must build new nuclear. I'll stop. Southern Company is leading the renaissance of new nuclear by building this big plant. Vogel, and it's going terrific. When we started the plant, we thought it was going to be a 12% price increase. It's a $14 billion deal over 10 years. Now it appears the price increase is only going to be about 6 to 8%. Doesn't get reported because people like to report the bad news instead of the good news. It's a raging success so far. And the kind of technology we're deploying would have obviated a lot of the problems that we saw in Fukushima. So what kind of companies should do nuclear? Great big ones with scale. We're a $40 billion market cap company. Companies that have the highest level of financial integrity because you're going to be involved with great sums of money over long periods of time. We know the nation's financial markets go in and out. And then you better be darn good. You better be credible in operations. It's not a business for beginners. The visceral feel is fascinating. Where are you from? California. Okay, so I know where you are. <laughs> or at least broadly your state. I don't know where you are. I'm just joking, too. But, but put Vogel is not in a seismic sensitive area. California has some really challenges there. Plant Vogel is not on a coastline. And then we're using this newest, safest technology around. The polling in the southeast for nuclear is enormously positive. And it's not just the public. Look, we've had great support from the current governor and the past governor. We've had great support with our regulators. Great support from the General Assembly in Georgia. You know what this represents. It's the biggest economic development project in the state. And it will deliver for the families we're privileged to serve for decades to come power at the gas equivalent price of about a buck per million BTU. The polling for us has been in the range of 70 to 90 percent, depending on when and how. There is no negative visceral feel. What I would tell the United States is get serious about nuclear, do more of it. You want to put more incentives in place? I would take them away from renewables and put them in nuclear. Do we have time for one brief question? Okay, are you up, are you up for yeah, it? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll stay for days. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I can keep it brief. Um, could you talk a little bit, Tom, about what you see as the role of distributor generation? Yes. And, and what that means in terms of your business model. I mean, you've talked a lot about how Southern Company yeah. makes big bets in nuclear, in solar, et cetera. But distributor generation is about decentralized expansion. Yes. Uh, I, I'm all for it. Uh, and it was funny. We do these. So remember, we do these visioning exercises. The other thing Southern Company does, we really try and integrate innovation into our business practices. We do these. Focus dialogues is what we call them. So we'll get 100 people, so it's a 26,000, mm -hmm. but we get 100 people around an issue. And we have people get up here on a stage and kind of go through the issue with mind-numbing amounts of detail, and you're supposed to be prepared when you walk in. And we vote and argue and fight. We institutionalize food fights. And we did one three years ago, Chris, right, on distributed generation. And at the end of the day, we took a vote you know, we did one of these, and it was 88 to 12 that distributed generation will never happen because it's a dumb idea. I was in the 12, and I was right. <laughs> and now, everybody understands that I think distributed generation is going to come here. But let's understand what distributed generation is. If anybody's been watching my stuff over the past four years, I have always been in the renewable space. I have been much more a zealot on photovoltaics not thermal uh, solar, photovoltaics. And I've never been that much of a fan on wind. Wind certainly has its place. Please understand the northern plains in certain areas of the United States and Texas. They've overdone it in Texas, but wind has its place too, not in the southeast. So I've been all focused on solar, and we're one of the largest solar players. Largest voluntary solar program in the United States is in the state of Georgia. 
here you go on distributed generation. And this is one of the reasons why I thought us getting involved early in solar made sense, because I absolutely believe one of the infirmities you have on renewables is that typically where the great resources are, there are no people. So solar is really good in the desert southwest, wind is really good in the upper plains, and there's nobody to consume all that energy, so you need big transmission lines to move it. The other issue you have is intermittency. In other words, what do you do when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine? Third thing is there's enormous tax credits. Uh, EIA's own data, Energy Information Administration, would give 100 times the tax preference items uh, to renewables in terms of solar and wind and are available for coal, natural gas, and oil, and about 35 times uh, nuclear. Now, I take advantage of all that. I do. I think it's bad policy. One of the ways that you can take advantage of eliminating one of those barriers is to do distributed generation. Put the photovoltaic cell on something right near the consumption. Well, on your house. Makes perfect sense. Now you don't have the problem of transmission. You do have other problems that arise, and they're not getting enough play. So I always, well, I'll tell you, power quality is something you have to watch. When you put a solar panel on your house, even when a cloud goes over, if you're dealing with big central station solar farms in the desert somewhere, which we own, you get a portfolio effect that smooths out as clouds come across. If you have one on your house, as a cloud comes across and then leaves, your power quality does this. And if you don't do something to manage that volatility, it will burn up your HVAC systems and a variety of other things. The real, so I think distributed generation is here. In our sense, it's not particularly economic. That's because we're so cheap as a system anyway. But clearly in California or New York or a variety of other places, it, it passes the economic hurdles. I'm all in favor of it. And in fact, I always like to use this phrase when I think about supporting customers' needs. You can't keep the waves off the beach. And in any environment in the future, that may have an impact on customers' value, you better find a way to play offense. You can't just play defense. So what we've instructed our guys to do, even though we're so cheap and you're not going to see the penetration of distributed solar in the southeast, we're playing hard offense. I want to win that business. Now here's the real, I don't think distributed generation in and of itself is all that disruptive. If you could link it with some storage capability that wipes away a lot of the problems, then I think you got something. So it's interesting. So wait a minute. Now, you, as you know, there's <clears throat> people who would argue that cheap generation, you know, distributed, and cheap storage allows customers to go out from the grid, go right. out from, from you guys. That's right. And so you hear phrases like the utility, enter the utility death spiral, and that sort of thing. Dead wrong. No, so, no, I'm just, I, yeah, I'm yeah, dead, yeah. But you know the argument, right? Oh, sure, and, oh, sure. And oh, so, sure. you know, it's not a crazy argument in the sense that no, people like no. Barclays recently. It, um, it, it's you know, a darn good it. argument. Yeah. That's my point, though. Mm -hmm. So that's why we so invest in long term research. Mm -hmm. The point is, Charles, and you make the point if I'm just going to sit here and play defense and try and keep the waves off the beach, you're in a death spiral. Mm -hmm. My view is let's understand that. Let's get ahead of the curve. Why don't we own infrastructure? Why don't we own the panel on the rooftop? Why don't we own the storage device? Why don't we own electricity vehicle uh, charging station? All of that is my business. I want to own that. I want to have that business. Thank you very much. I think thanks, you, folks. Yeah. Appreciate it.